notice anything different, Daniel? Did you get new glasses? Oh, you mean my <laughs> new Muse Academies? But wait, not one pair, Danielle. Boom. Two. Oh, you like my Atato Lightnings? But wait, what about boom? My Revel Tour de Force shades with my prescription built right in. I feel like Guy Fieri when I wear these. Three pairs of glasses. Did you get an inheritance or something? No. I learned about today's video sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers over 9,000 prescription glasses and sunglasses, including in-house brands like Muse and Amelia E and designer brands like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Ooh. Gucci, and many more at, brace yourself, Danielle. Okay. Up to 70% off retail prices. I don't think we have that store near us. Oh yes, you do. GlassesUSA.com is right in your pocket. You can mm. shop for all your eyewear needs online at affordable prices, starting at only 30 bucks with basic prescription lenses included without ever leaving your home. They have an easy to navigate website that will let you virtually try on any pair. When you find the ones you like, they take you step-by-step step through the ordering process and keep you up to date on your order soon. I had my glasses in hand. Okay, but what if you don't like them when you try them on at home? GlassesUSA.com has a risk-free shopping experience, free shipping and returns, a 100% money-back guarantee, including a full refund within 14 days of delivery, no questions asked. But John, it's me. I don't remember my prescription. They've got you covered again. Using their free app called Prescription Scanner, you can scan your current glasses to figure out your prescription. Do you think that you'll finally be able to read your scripts correctly now? Well, my new blue light glasses reduce eye strain during screen time, increasing productivity. I've even noticed that I can play video games longer when I use them, and you know how happy that makes me, Danielle. I'm sold, I have to check this out. We have a special link in the description box down below so you can get your own great glasses at amazing prices. Thanks again, GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring today's video. Now, let's get on with the show. Welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen, and we have to start today's episode by saying Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. It's like we practiced it or something. It's glorious. That was great. <clears throat> if if it was a time where people still use recordings like that for ringtones. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> none of you would use it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. No. Crystal Donovan would, would use it. <laughs> she would. She would. Oh my gosh, you guys, I hope that everyone enjoyed the holiday season and maybe got that special gift that you've been waiting for all year. Oh, uh, you had to bring it up. What? I'm still waiting for my big gift. Well, what did you tell Santa that you wanted? One word, Danielle. Victory. It's time to see what happened with the results of our last episode, Black Friday Crimes Part 2, the heist edition. Last month, Danielle told the story of a team that infiltrated a target on Black Friday and made off with cold, hard cash. Well, I told the story of two clumsy criminals who stole a bunch of high-end wine, but then left so much evidence behind they'll be whining in jail for years <laughs> to come. How did it all play out, Danielle? All right, you guys. I think Santa may be delivering the gift now. <laughs> Really? <laughs> On Twitter, I received 41% of the votes and John received 59. And then on the website poll, he really whooped me. I had 21% of the votes and he had 79%. Ooh. That right there, that was a good solid victory. That was yeah. a great story. I love some good. wine, so I was very into it. <laughs> Not as good as the whooping you gave me last month, but I'll take it. Thank you all for the victory. Where's that cup, Danielle? I'm waiting for it. All right. I guess I can hand it over. There it is. Thank you so much. Mm, 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 mm. Delicious. I only it's spiked the, it. It's Yeah, it's a taste of sweet victory. It's in it there. It is. 
Yeah. It was well deserved though. That was a really great story. I really enjoyed it. I thought your story was great too. They were good. It was that was a banger of an episode. They were both tough stories to go head to head. Were, but who on yeah. earth is like in their free time saying, you know what, I'm gonna steal this Black Friday? <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds well, yeah. of bottles of wine. <laughs> Hopefully people will knock it off now. Yeah, we, we don't need any more stories about Black Friday crimes. No. But today we're looking for crimes where the people involved are blaming it on the paranormal. That is so unfair, Daniel. Why? Well, apparently the paranormal can't speak for itself. You have to get like Zach Baggins or mm -hmm. some team of questionable experts sneaking around in the middle of the night with a ghost box to let you know what the paranormal is saying. Also, there are no paranormal criminal defense attorneys at all. Wow. I looked, or if there are, they don't have a website. I could not find a single one, at least on this side of the astral plane. Well, John, I think you might need to pull your head out of your astral plane. You might be right. And there's only one way to do that. Let's get it started with a story told by the amazing Danielle Hallen. All right, you guys. I feel like this is a very interesting episode for John and I, because I think we have very interesting opinions on the paranormal. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say, I'm a believer in the paranormal, okay? Not all things, but if we're speaking like ghosts, potentially aliens for sure, I definitely have an open mind. I feel like if you think of everything that's unknown to us down to like our own ocean, we got to be a bit full of ourselves to believe that we know it all. And just because we may not have the ability or knowledge to prove something, I think doesn't entirely rule it out. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, see, I so think so. I, we, you know, there's no telling, man. And just because we can't prove it doesn't mean anything. We just might not have the ability to. Mm -hmm. And I will say though, but in my research for my YouTube channel and just my personal interests, I've seen countless of horror stories revolving around the paranormal. Stories where it's very clear that the mystery and the inability to find concrete evidence is kind of used as a crutch for criminal behavior. Or even, I can't not mention it, with the Netflix star himself. Uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> he says, uh-oh. <laughs> Cases where I feel like there's just, you know just enough strange information that the reality of the case is kind of overshadowed by an idea that paranormal is at play. Elisa Lamb looking at you. Yeah. But I also do think there's another category. And honestly, I think this is the most dangerous category. And it's those that truly believe, which, you know, hats off to you, more power to you, but it can lead people to take matters into their own hands and make very grave mistakes based on that belief. And this is exactly what happened to 26-year-old Kennedy Ife, his five siblings, and his parents. You're looking very intent. Anyone who's not watching the YouTube version of this, John's like, what's happening next? You've piqued my interest. No, that was yeah. uh, that was a great intro, and you've got me hooked. I'm, I'm ready. Now, this is definitely a darker story than anything I've ever told on this podcast. But when I saw it, I knew I had to speak about it. We mainly hear of exorcisms in movies. Or even potentially in like far off history. But this incident was incredibly recent. As in 2016 recent. Okay. Okay. And the end results blew my mind. And I have to have your opinion on it. Because this entire situation, this entire story is already sketchy, but it involves very prominent people. There was a trial involved. We're talking about an exorcism in 2016, yet you can barely find any information on it online. Mm, that's strange. Yeah. I'm telling you, all y'all are going to after this be like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> now, Kennedy Ife was from a very prominent family in Enfield, London. His father, Kenneth, was a very well-known business consultant, had a PhD in mineral resource engineering. His mother, Josephine, seemed to stay at home a lot of the time, and she's very heavily involved in the family's church, Jesus Sanctuary Ministries, which is based out of Southeast London. And Kenneth and Josephine raised Kennedy, who's the main character of the story, along with his five brothers, Colin, Harry, Roy, Daniel, and Samuel, in a very tight-knit family setting. And religion was really at the center of it all. And according to some reports, they had very extreme and interesting and 
strange religious practices. And I never really saw anyone elaborate on that, but that was something that was well known to the people that knew them. And so very interesting family. They, you know, never went without, lived in a mansion. They had meetings with the queen, you name it. So there's a lot going on here. A lot of people, a lot of moving parts, and apparently a lot of secrets. Okay. So Kennedy himself had gone on to become a very successful marketing consultant and was living a life of his own when he suddenly died under very suspicious circumstances on August 22nd, 2016. And the reality of what happened to him sounds like something from a movie. So that morning at around 9 a.m., Kennedy's brother Harry called into 999, which is like their version of 911. I'm sure we've all gathered that, but just want to clarify. Mm-hmm. And he was asking for help from the family's mansion in Enfield. He claimed that something was wrong with his brother, Kennedy, who was allegedly claiming that he was suffering from dehydration. But there was not a lot of information within this call. So paramedics kind of arrived and weren't really sure what they were going to walk into. And they were shocked at the scene that they found. Kennedy was held up in one of the rooms of the home. It was obvious that he had been there for some period of time, so longer than just a few hours. And when paramedics walked into this, they ended up asking the family, you know, um, huh, what's, go- what's going on here, guys? <laughs> like, there's a guy that's just been locked in this room. And the family stated very calmly that Kennedy had been, quote, very agitated over the last three days. So they restrained him. Ooh. Okay. They claimed that after restraining him, he developed breathing issues. And so at this point, when they realized, oh, something's tr- something wrong is going on here, they decided to call for help. So still very cryptic, not a lot of details. And the paramedics were like, okay, <laughs> this is already shaping up to be a very odd story. And at this point, paramedics aren't sure how long really he's been tied up. Was he tied up the whole three days? Like, what's going on here? What exactly does the family mean that, you know, by Kennedy was agitated? But they could tell that something was not right here because Kennedy had numerous, like, injuries on his body. Like, clear marks that he had been bound tightly. His breathing was all over the place when they checked him. His temperature was skyrocketing. And despite attempts to lower his temperature, lower that heart rate, unfortunately, Kennedy ended up being pronounced dead by paramedics just after 10 p.m. So this Mm. isn't just like, oh, he was acting strange. We tied him up and like all of a sudden something strange is going on. Like he was very seriously in need of help, like incredibly distressed. And so knowing something is off here with this entire situation the paramedics call in to the police and they're like hey we got something weird happening here like you've got to come in here and almost as if to solidify their concerns after kennedy was pronounced dead paramedics and the police who had arrived ended up watching as the family attempted to resurrect him Uh Oh, okay. Chanting and praying and saying, quote, Kennedy, I command you to rise in the name of Jesus. I probably just woke some spirit. Yeah. yeah. Out of my creepy woods. Things to not say at the farm. Yeah. No, seriously. If I don't make it to the next episode. (laughs) Now, I do want to quickly state that there are tons of different religions and religious practices and rituals that are incredibly important. Um, performed all over the world. But this situation was different. So I don't want anyone to think that, you know, I'm coming for anyone. It was very clear something not right was going on here. He was not being treated properly. And so there was a lot of concern seeing this. So Kennedy ended up being transferred from the home, obviously, to receive an autopsy. The family really maintained the same idea that, oh, no, we, you know, just restrained him. He was upset without offering any more details. And this Which, by the way, time- let me just say, yeah. s- sounds like mm-hmm. abuse. Yeah, exactly. Like, let's just be clear about it. I mean, I don't know how you wrap that up in some type of religious belief and make it acceptable in some way of like, oh, no, well, we just had him tied up. Like, yeah, hold on a second. Oh, (laughs) you're going to hate the the end of my story. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I mean, he wasn't behaving right. We Mm -hmm. tied him up, which uh, we we've done coverage over on Seriously Mysterious Mm -hmm. about the case that inspired the exorcist story. Yeah. And, you know, some of the experts in those situations think that this is just children that are acting up. And and sometimes. Y'all, the amount of times I could say my child probably needs an exorcism. 
<laughs> like what level of scream was that like it yeah yeah you know it's it's pretty serious and you know you're right i don't know how they managed to package it in a boat like i don't know how they did that and they seemingly like didn't see anything wrong with what they've done so like we already know they're probably withholding information but even the information they are giving it's right. like wait <laughs> wait what um but then the autopsy came back and obviously won't dive into it too deep here, but he had over 60 wounds on him, including uh, a bite mark. Okay. And uh, his cause of death was found to be cardio respiratory arrest due to being restrained. So it seemed that the police and the paramedics, they were all on top of it with their speculation. Yep. Kennedy had essentially been like tortured in that room. And so right away, an investigation was launched by the Homicide and Major Crime Command. So police began to search the home and ended up finding a note on Josephine's bed that spoke about bewitching of offspring and seemed to hold the steps to some sort of ritual. And they also ended up finding this bag that had clearly been tossed like from the IF home over to the neighbor's garden area. And this bag was just cram packed with dozens and dozens of cable ties black handcuffs like other restraints and so they're like if he hadn't started breathing badly like would you have ever called for help like how long would this have gone on here right right so the family obviously didn't want the full truth either now seeing this you know of what happened during those days leading up to Kennedy's death to come to the surface but it was obvious something much deeper had happened in this home and so ultimately the entire family we're talking about all five siblings, the mom and the dad, seven people were arrested and charged with manslaughter, false imprisonment, and causing or allowing the death of a vulnerable adult. And the reality that came to light during the trial <laughs> was terrifying. So in the two weeks leading to his death, the family claimed that Ken Kennedy suddenly became unwell, like nothing seriously abnormal. He was just having trouble sleeping complaining of a pain in his throat you know like he's just getting sick or something but shortly after these complaints his family said that he began to speak about a python or a snake being inside of him mm. and so he's starting to talk about things that very clearly are not actually happening he had all of these odd ramblings and so the family at this point began to worry but it all kind of came to a head on august 19th 2016 so just three days prior to his or before his death um so kenneth ife the father was actually with kennedy on that day the 19th when all of a sudden kennedy just snapped and apparently became violent he bit his father he was threatening to harm himself and threatening to harm others. And I'm not a psychologist, psychiatrist, a doctor, any of that, but it seems apparent there was some sort of mental break happening. I don't know if it was the onset of something. Um, you know, there's no telling. And being 26 years old, that is a typical time frame for certain things to appear. Um, there was a lot. And... This was so unlike him. Obviously, this had gone past him just being ill. So the family at this point is like, all right, we got to do something. But they didn't say, hey, let's go to a doctor or let's call a professional for help. Like, let's take him to a psychiatrist, anything. Instead, they called their church, which, again, I want to make it clear. It's no problem to call your church and ask for prayers. But that is not at all what they did. They. Well, according to reports. Again, they had these un unusual religious practices, and I guess in their minds, they didn't believe that Kennedy was suffering from any sort of mental illness. Um, he wasn't suffering from, you know, anything that manifested out of like maybe a physical illness. They believed that he was possessed, and they planned to quote cure him, which isn't something that <clears throat> I mean, you know, like even looking into like the exorcism and stuff, like mm -hmm. or the exorcist. You know, uh, you're supposed to talk to experts there, too. And there was priests exactly. that were working at universities and stuff that were consulted and brought in and, you it's know, like spoke to deal. their superiors. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just like, oh, well, dad's going to handle the exorcism. Mm -hmm. Like, not at yeah, all. Like, there's a whole not... chain of events that you have to go to within the church. Yeah. Um, like people you have to get past. They usually I mean, 
according to what I've seen, and I know there's a lot of like people that don't believe they do, but they actually usually the first step is to send them to a psychiatrist mm -hmm. or a psychologist to just ensure that there's not something else going on because obviously an exorcism is a little bit uh, scary. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, but they totally bypass this. I don't know what the situation was in terms of, I don't know if they were encouraged to do this uh, by the church. I don't know if they just decided to do it on their own. There's not a lot of information on that out there, but all I know is the decision was made by the family to take matters into their own hands. And so Kenneth Ive instructed his other sons to subdue Kennedy and restrain him in one of the seven bedrooms in their mansion as they just like lived life as usual, telling them to use, quote, overwhelming force if they needed to ensure that he stayed in the bedroom and they were able to exercise these demons from his body. And so from there, the brothers were like taking turns, watching over him and praying over him. Like he obviously had all these injuries. So something else happened to him. And Kennedy stayed like this for three days. Now, during the trial, and this is probably almost like some of the most shocking information, none of them seemed to understand that what they did was not okay. So Roy Eif, one of his brothers, was asked if the family had ever considered calling for professional help. And he mm -hmm. said no. He said Kennedy was just out of sorts from sleep deprivation. Everyone's an expert in this family. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And like they seem to keep bouncing back and forth during the trial of just saying, oh, it was sleep deprivation. And oh, it was a demon. <laughs> like just <laughs> it went both ways. And I think it was like partly trying to clean up the mess that they made. But like if it was sleep deprivation, why on the good googly moogly did you decide that the best way to deal with that was to act the way that you did. Well, I'm sure, you know, once you get a lawyer involved in this conversation that's trying to, you know, get these mm -hmm. people through a process yep. like that, they're going to say like, hey, you know, this whole exorcism thing, it's yeah. not going to work in court. Like, we need to say something else. So exactly. that's probably where the sleep deprivation stuff's coming from. Now, mm. his brother Colin claimed that he felt or why he didn't, you know, call for professional help was because he felt it was a, quote, domestic issue that needed to be dealt with at home. And he said that he didn't believe Kennedy was suffering from anything serious, but in the exact same breath stated that he saw another personality coming through in his brother and that something had taken over his brother saying, quote, it's clear that thing was in him when we believed what we believed was a demon because it was not natural. It was clearly trying to kill him. Now, if you've ever spoken to someone that uh, has had a, a friend or a family member dealing with bipolar disorder. Mm, yep. You know, I'm pretty sure you would hear a very, very similar description of that. And then yep. once again, it's just pointing back to this big question about like, how is this family the experts in this situation? Like, why mm -hmm. is no one calling for legitimate help in this situation? Well, and they how... should be held as, as criminals. They, sh they should be tried. Well, and that that whole statement was like crazy to me because he straight up said he's not suffering from anything serious but, but then it's like oh but also demons trying to kill him that's inside of him and i'm like well which is it here yeah yeah um now the jury continued to hear about kennedy hearing voices i guess he would speak about the mark of the beast like just rambling all these like things that were abnormal um, the family claimed that they had to remove all of the knives from the kitchen, saying that Kennedy had tried to, tried to possibly harm his mother. Um, but in the same breath, they actually stood behind their exorcism and said that he would improve after they prayed for him. Mm. Like after some of the rituals that they did, that he would improve, that there were random times during the middle of the night that he would seem better, um, that there was a full moon one night and he did way better than as well. And so they genuinely believed they were helping him. The prosecutor, Tom Little, stated, quote, they decided that he should be restrained in his own home with them rather than calling 999. Ultimately, that restraint was the cause of his tragic death. Now, as you can assume, conspiracies flew. <laughs> yeah. Like flew around because the dad was just pictured with the queen. Um, and actually, <laughs> came, I know. <laughs> You're like, oh, great. <laughs> wow. Um, and it came out that the family had ties to different cults and secret societies. Um, I believe that his father was originally from Nigeria. So, again, there's like a lot of like 
you know, different voodoo that's practiced around the world and like witchcraft. And there's so many different beliefs. Um, and so a lot of people believed, you know, maybe that had something to do with it. Everyone was just feeling incredibly uneasy, but Kenneth, the father was adamant that his religious practices and his ties to those other entities played no part in his son's death. And interestingly, there were actually a few different um, religious leaders that came and, and, you know, took the stand. They had spoken to the family and they claimed that the family came to them saying that Kennedy wouldn't go to a doctor. And so they had to perform a certain ritual. Now, the family is never quoted saying anything of the sorts. They are quoted in saying they had no choice and like they didn't consider going to a doctor like that was never on their mind. So mm. I don't know. Um, but basically, despite all of this. The admissions that they tied him up for days, that they did so to get the devil out of him, that they performed an entire exorcism on this man. The Emmy found that the cause of death was directly related to the treatment. The jury found the entire family not guilty on March 14th, 2019. What? Why? Do you, do you see why I had to tell you this story now? Oh, I am are you so kidding me? Beside myself, I have lost sleep over this. Why? Now, so you can't find a lot on it. That's why I'm so sketched out by this. It's Hold on. How, it. how old was Kennedy? He was 26. Is it because he's an adult? They're thinking that he's so, giving into this process in some way. I don't, but he's being my restrained. assumption on like, so from what I have seen and it's only, it was only stated in one resource. So I cannot say for a fact, this is the truth. Um, but from the way I've seen it explained, ultimately it was determined that they simply did not realize what they were doing was wrong because of the depth of their religion. So like, Ugh. you know how in order to be charged and, you know, prosecuted for a crime, sentenced the whole nine yards, you have to like have an understanding that what you did was wrong. It's yeah. like the it's like the equivalent of like pleading insanity. You didn't have an understanding of it. They well, and there's also there's clearly no intent. Like this yes. this is more of an yeah. accidental situation mm -hmm. based on their belief structure which i, I mean it was just manslaughter charges so yeah yeah necessarily there didn't have to be intent there yeah i'm beside myself <laughs> yeah um but that's the way i've seen it explained that you know the depth of their religion and they strongly believed what they were doing was correct and i'd so have to believe if this charged. was if this was a 13 year old we were talking about it would have been a different outcome a completely I'd have to different it. story yeah yeah. completely different story mm. and i mean i have to, i don't know i mean they are we're a very prominent family as well and so did that come into play i mean it's just absolutely wild to me and i mean i will say though that i feel like there is so much that we're missing just because there's not a lot of information out there and I'm, or maybe that's just me being hopeful because i feel like there has to be something else for the jury to have come to that conclusion. But it's like I stated earlier, like you don't, what will ever, could ever be said that negates the facts that are out there, like that somehow excuses them. Like, yeah, but you're, you're raising a really interesting point, a story of that nature coming out of the UK mm -hmm. with the type of journalism that can happen out there. You should yeah. have bumped into tons of information about this. Nothing. That's Nothing. weird. That's weird. Yeah. Mm. I'm telling you, it's freaking bizarre. And there's like one or maybe like two to three articles from like the New York Times on it, like just re-reporting like over yeah. here. But I don't know. It's mm. a weird time, you guys. I don't know. I just feel like you don't watch someone, I don't know, essentially die for three days straight and not reach out for help. And like the idea that they did this because they thought he was possessed by spirits or demons. And then they got away with it. Yeah, I'm freaked out. <laughs> yeah, that's insane. Yeah, and so a huge thank you to Infield Independent, Independent UK, Standard UK, List First, New York Times. Mm. I don't know, y'all. I'm not feeling very great about this story well let me ask you a it's question wild. Did, are you believing any aspect of the possession no see here's the thing i am huge on psychology 
And I feel like that is one, I don't know. Okay. Here's the thing with churches and different religions, it's known that they have frequently in the like history, all history turned an eye on mental illness, believing that it's not real. Um, and instead using that to kind of fuel their belief that there is an evil like entity, whether that's the devil or, you know, anything along those lines. And so, I mean, we've, we know for a fact that people that suffer with certain mental illnesses can display things that can, you know, you can very easily chalk up to that and turn it the way you want to. And I'm not believing any sort of paranormal activity in this story and that there was any sort of possession. What I think unfortunately may have happened is, you know, because he was saying certain things like I have a snake, I have a python inside of me. If he was very religious and he's having these very scary things start happening in his mind, he's going to immediately jump to, I have to be possessed. You know what I mean? Like we all want to explain it. Why am I thinking this way? Why am I feeling this way? And so I think maybe he introduced that idea potentially out of like fear or what have you. But I think at the bottom of it, he was suffering from some sort of onset of a mental illness. And I don't know. I mean, let's, let's run this, run it this way. If, uh, if it was his belief he was suffering from something like that mm-hmm. and he thought that the only way to stop suffering in that way was to end his own life mm-hmm. and he asked for someone to help him end his own life yeah would they be held criminally liable We're on probably a slope man i know i know you but like pr- a serious one but it's probably like yeah. it, it, it leans towards yeah. There's you're yep. you're going to see cases where people get convicted in mm-hmm. that situation. So it's weird because you know his belief structure obviously ingrained in him through yeah. uh, his his family and his experience, and that affects his vocabulary and his how he talks about things. Exactly. So, uh, at first, I was questioning like who. I wonder if he even said that stuff. Like I wonder if this is just what the I family... do question that as well though. Yeah, is this what the family is saying mm-hmm. he said so that it supports their story that that he was possessed in some way? Um, but honestly, it's he could have thought that. Even if he did, uh, it seems super, super negligent on the family's part Absolutely. that they didn't reach out for good yep. professional help in that situation. And it's mm-hmm. tragic because those three days were probably terrible for everybody. And then yep. to have that outcome at the end <clears throat> is the worst. So, um, yeah. I'm telling mm. you. And it's just so crazy to me because you don't hear about things like that ever. Like, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I keep like trying to like put myself in like their mindset to like try to understand why they did certain things. You know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. And I'm like, in like today, <laughs> like 2016, like you genuinely believed that you were making the right choice. Like it just yeah blew me away. That's a good blew point too. Me away. Yeah. If you were telling me a story from the 60s or 70s like that, oh. and I heard they got off, I'd be like, oh, okay. Yeah, probably. But we're but, talking. <laughs> yeah. That's, hmm. Y'all, wow. I need to hear your opinions on this. Yeah. Well... Danielle has left us all unsettled. Yep. You're welcome. With a story <laughs> where justice did not yeah. arrive. Mm-hmm. Can I turn this boat around and tell a good story where we have a solid outcome? I hope so. I needed it at this point. I was relying on you to have it because I was like, my story is going to. It's going to leave us all on the edge. John has to take, this, take us the rest of the way here. We're going to have to find out on the other side of this commercial break. John, what? Shh, what? Shh, Danielle, not, not right now. Not right now. I'm connecting with the other side using my spirit box. What do you want? How can we help you? Hello, Fresh. Hello, Fresh. Hello, Fresh? Oh. Well, we know all about that. Food is super expensive over here. You will love how fast, easy, and affordable it is to whip up a restaurant-quality meal right in your own kitchen with HelloFresh. Plus, quality is HelloFresh's priority. Ingredients travel from the farm to your home in less than seven days, so you know that they're... Fresh. 
Yes, fresh. And if you're running short on time, HelloFresh's latest line of meals feature meals that are ready in less than 15 minutes. You can enjoy all the taste and quality with even less time than before and spend your extra time haunting your friends. Oh, I know you're new to this paranormal stuff, Danielle, but I believe mm -hmm. the proper term is ghosting your friends. No, no, that's, that's not what that means. Is he always this dumb? You have no idea. What I do know is that the vegetarian buffalo cauliflower tacos I had last week were mm. some of the best HelloFresh dishes that I've had yet. A uh, crispy tempura batter gives the cauliflower some serious crunch, while the seasoning and hot sauce brings flavor and heat all pulled together in a flour tortilla with a tangy sweet slaw, scallion greens for a little crunch on it. I want more right now, and Danielle, you have to try them if you see them pop up on your menu. Oh, I absolutely will. I feel like the chefs just keep coming up with new recipes to keep your choices fresh. Now go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime21 and use code CrimeAfterCrime21 for 21 meals, free meals, plus free shipping. Start the new year off right. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime21 and use code CrimeAfterCrime21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. Try America's number one meal kit today. Listen to the box. Mm -hmm. The box knows it all. All right, everyone. Welcome back. We're relying on you, John. <laughs> We're relying on you. We really are. I've got to turn things story, around. Man, I get you it. Do. You got to turn it around for us here because I'm left feeling very unsure right now. The only thing I can hope for is that we first of all, that I tell a, an interesting story, but outside of mm -hmm. that, I need some justice after what you dropped on us, Daniel. Absolutely. That's what I need. Mm -hmm. uh, to do that, we're going to have to hop in the crime after crime DeLorean and travel back in time, back to June 1987. Ah, June 1987. I remember you well. Little Johnny Lorden would have been 11 years old back then, watching Hulk Hogan fight Andre the Giant in WrestleMania 3, laughing at these funny little short cartoon segments on the Tracy Ullman show about some family called the Simpsons, riding his bike to the local video store to rent Transformers the movie. No, not the Mark Wahlberg ones. No, not the Shia LaBeouf ones. The cartoon. The one that made bo little boys all over America cry when Optimus Prime was killed so they could sell more toys of the new Autobot leader Rodimus Prime. It was a dark time for me, but <laughs> it was a much darker time for the family of a 16-year-old girl named Teresa Ann Beer. It was the evening of June 1st in Fresno, California, and the police were called to the home of John Richmond to take a report on a missing person. John was the uncle and legal guardian of Teresa, a girl who came from a broken family. Her parents had severe issues and the children were taken from them before they split up. Teresa was eventually taken in by her uncle and became part of his family. She had left that morning with a man named Russell Welch, who also goes by the name Skip. Skip was an acquaintance of John's and was visiting and staying nearby. He offered to give Teresa a ride to Central High School that Monday morning in his 1977 Monte Carlo. But later that evening, when she never came home and Skip wasn't anywhere to be found, Uncle John knew something was seriously wrong. He would tell the responding officers about Teresa, that she had hazel eyes and shoulder-length dark hair, that she was 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighed around 105 pounds, and that she had a high-pitched voice that you might think was coming from an eight or nine-year-old. Investigators would find out that Teresa never showed up to school that day. They also found witnesses who said that Skip and Teresa were seen at different locations. Fresno Police Detective Doug Stokes would tell the Fresno Bee she was seen by people who knew her. They said she told them they were going to the mountains, and she was pretty excited about the whole thing. Hmm. Stokes kept looking into the case and learned that Skip was familiar with the mountains between Yosemite and Madera. Stokes decided he needed some further assistance, so he reached out to the Mariposa County Sheriff's Department, the U.S. Forest Service Rangers, and the Madera County Sheriff's Department, giving them all the details and descriptions of both Skip and Teresa, plus Skip's car 
the, town, the tan and brown two-door 1977 Monte Carlo. A few days later, June 5th, Madera County Sheriff's deputies spotted the car. It was parked in a remote area. No one was in or around it. Sheriff's deputies decided that they would keep tabs on the car by checking back later, but when they came back later, the car was gone. The investigation continued, and Detective Stokes thought, where is the usual place for a criminal to try to hide out? So on June 10th, they found Skip at his mommy's house. <laughs> That's so true. For a minute, I was like, where is that going to be? Oh my yeah. gosh, what are they thinking of? But then you said it, and I'm like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Of course. <laughs> He's at his mommy's house, Daniel. Of course. Absolutely. It was in Sunnyvale, just a few miles outside of Fresno, and Skip was immediately taken into custody, but it wasn't for kidnapping. It was for an active warrant on failing to appear in court on a drunk driving violation. Whew. But thankfully, they had their man in custody and could question him on where exactly was Teresa. So Skip decides to cooperate, leading investigators, including Detective Stokes, to a campsite in the Sierra Mountains near an area called Shut Eye Peak. Now, what was his story? De Detective Stokes would tell the press, quote, he said this is where he and Teresa had set up camp before she disappeared he claims they made several sightings of Bigfoot and that he wanted to return to the camp, but she refused and they became separated. Mm. This is your favorite. Oh, Bigfoot? Oh, yeah. <laughs> your favorite. <laughs> yes. But Danielle, this man told them that Bigfoot had kidnapped Teresa. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's the most realistic thing I've ever heard. This is why I was saying earlier, the paranormal just catches all the grief and they can't defend themselves. No, they can't. They can't say, hey, I'm yeah. not real. Bigfoot can't come up and be like, hey, guys, I did I not kidnap Teresa. <laughs> now, while tales of Bigfoot-like creatures have sprung up in many places in the world over possibly hundreds or even thousands mm -hmm. of years, History.com notes that the American legend of Bigfoot actually started pretty recently. In 1958, when oh, a wow. newspaper... I know. Isn't that surprising? I didn't know that. Like, Very I imagined... Yeah, mm -hmm. I imagine like, cowboys talking about Bigfoot oh, yeah. and stuff. But absolutely. Yeah, no. It started in 58, when a newspaper called the Humboldt Times ran a letter from a reader in Northern California who mentioned a story that they had heard from local area loggers about discovering giant footprints. <laughs> so think about that chain. You're reading about it in a newspaper mm -hmm. that was sent in by someone that wrote a letter that heard the story from these loggers <laughs> that one of them found giant footprints. Oh, that, that's a lot of levels. That's a fun uh, game of telephone. Wonder yeah. How much that changed. <laughs> right. So, you know, this newspaper puts it out and then all, all of a sudden, hey, yeah, readers love this story. So mm -hmm. what does the paper do? Let's do more articles on it. In those articles, the journalists, and I use that term somewhat regrettably, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. theorized that maybe the 16-inch tracks were made by a relative of the abominable snowman of the Himalayas, or a huge but harmless wild man traveling through the wilderness. And they also told the public that the loggers were calling the creature Bigfoot. Now, by Creative. The, yeah, pretty creative, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Why do loggers not become film writers? That's what I, I want to know. know. <laughs> movie. What's the title <laughs> of your movie? Movie. <laughs> big screen. Uh, movie. Big sc you know what? Honestly, I will say I have never like looked into the history of Bigfoot or anything. I had no idea. But if I had known any of this. I don't know, you guys. I don't think most people do, or I feel like things would be a little bit different. I don't know. Uh, no, honestly, you know, mm. I've I've been into the Bigfoot thing. Yeah, because uh, it's interesting. I yeah. still think it could potentially be giant people that are hiding, but we won't this, go there. <laughs> this research pulled me into all this information. I never knew any of this before. It's, it's so, crazy. Yeah. And I've watched, I can't count how many documentaries I've watched. Yep. They're not talking about this aspect of it, obviously. No. Um, so basically by the 1970s, there was these, they call them pseudo documentaries and oh, they were, Lord. which honestly is a lot of the stuff I've watched, I'd say is yeah. also pseudo documentaries. 
uh, there, there was these movies in the 70s that were investigating Bigfoot's existence, and they would even portray Bigfoot as a sexual predator. And that was until about 1987, when a little movie called Harry and the Hendersons would shift public perception of Bigfoot by associating him with comedy and environmentalism. But it was clear that Bigfoot was clearly a media icon, especially after being portrayed in the early 2000s in a Milwaukee beer commercial where the title creature was played by the Oscar-deserving actor John Lorden. Did you know that? <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not. One of my first television appearances was playing Bigfoot on a beer in a beer commercial. This just made this entire episode my favorite of all time. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't oh, I know if I it. have a copy. If I have a copy of it, I'll, I'll put it in right now. I think it'd be okay for me to put it in. This commercial's super old, but uh, oh yeah. Oh my gosh. And it was actually a Chewbacca <laughs> costume I was wearing, but we used that for, for portraying Bigfoot. Anyway. Yeah, well, we, I mean, you know, no one's ever seen it. You never know. Just yeah, toss on yeah. whatever and we'll just let people run with it. Yeah. Anyway, we, we've taken <laughs> a big footed step off track. Let's Let's pull it back on track here. Uh, what I do wonder after looking into the mm -hmm. history of Bigfoot, mm -hmm. and especially with a thing in the 1970s about him possibly being seen as a sexual predator of some kind, yep. Yep. I'm wondering if that's mm -hmm. part of the cover up story that Skip is actually leaning into. Yep. You know, uh, the Harry and the Hendersons twist that wouldn't come out until the year after this disappearance. And if Teresa's body was found and she had been harmed, could Skip use that current public perception yeah. of Bigfoot to kind of defend himself? Uh, so Skip Welch told investigators that he last saw Teresa on the evening of June 2nd and that she was either kidnapped by Bigfoot or possibly she left the area with another camper. Investigators were able to find some personal items that belonged to Teresa at the campsite, including clothing and her purse. So this campsite he took them to it seems like she was there. Her items are at least there. Now, if he leaves the campsite, why is he leaving her purse behind? Why is her clothing there? Yeah. Like, I have questions about it just because, like, wait, she was going to school for the day. Like, did she exactly. pack a, a bag to go camping? Or was the clothing <clears throat> that they found the clothing she was actually wearing? But Yep. Uh, so Skip Welch also told them that he stayed out in the wilderness looking for Teresa for two days. But... When those efforts were fruitless, he came back to Fresno. Do you think he told anyone that Teresa went missing when he Absolutely got back to not. town? Yeah, nope. no, no. I worked so hard for two days. I tried my hardest. I looked everywhere. I was alone on the mountain. But then all of those efforts, I just decided to. I just gave up. Never mind. And I, <laughs> yeah, and I left her purse. Yeah. Left it out in the woods. Why not? Went from one extreme to another. A full-scale search effort was launched by the Madera County Sheriff's Office, including bloodhounds, horses, and even passes by the Highway Patrol's helicopter. They looked for two days, and they just could not find any trace of Teresa. They asked campers to keep an eye out. They told the media they were looking for anyone that had seen Skip and Teresa together after June 1st. Madera Sheriff Al Conway also told the press that he was familiar with the Bigfoot legend, but had never heard of a sighting in that area. Uh, he also said that their search efforts didn't find any traces of unknown creatures being in that area. However, Skip Welch said they definitely saw Bigfoot several times, that there is more than one Bigfoot, and that the Bigfoots, or the Big Feets, I don't know how to say that Big right. Feet. They're able to communicate with each other. <clears throat> Skip does know a lot, man. Well, yeah, he describes himself as a student of Bigfoot. Absolutely. That's and, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he calls himself Skip. Uh, he also <laughs> says that they stand between seven and nine feet tall with dark, short hair. Within days, newspapers were reporting that foul play was suspected. And as investigators tried to understand this ludicrous story, they decided to focus on an important question. Why did a 16-year-old girl decide to go with a 43-year-old man into the woods alone? You know, I've been asking myself this this entire time so far. It's a good question. Investigators learned that Teresa was described as a slow learner. She was an older freshman at the age of 16, and she was very immature for her age. Uncle John believed that she had been brainwashed with these stories about Bigfoot and 
some of the witnesses that saw her in town on June 1st, the ones that recognized her. Oh, no. They said that she specifically mentioned going to the woods specifically to search for Bigfoot and that she was really excited to do it. Oh, man. Just got rope doped by this guy. Yeah, exactly. Investigators decided to file charges against Skip Welch for felony child stealing. He wound up pleading innocent to the charges and he was released without paying any bail amount. However, a day later, he was rearrested after the court took a closer look at the case. <laughs> I've never heard of that, but I wish it would happen more often. <laughs> I let the guy out for a day and then no 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 go get him back wait a minute <laughs> now let's set a bigger bail amount like give him a minute to Good breathe grief they then ordered a bail amount set at thirty thousand dollars and he was held at the fresno county jail he would stay there until october when three days before his trial danielle the unthinkable would happen bigfoot shows up <laughs> the bigfoot showed up and said i did it no i did it the charge was dismissed. What? No. John, this is not the way the story was supposed to go. I know. I know. Maybe we should retitle today's How? episode, Missing Justice. How the, on earth? The charge was dismissed. Why? El Voice Hooper. Just not evidence, maybe? Like physical evidence of any kind? or. But the charge they were going for is a little <clears throat> different. It's not. I mean, it's yeah. felony child stealing. Oh, he yeah, did. I forgot that's the only charge he had. They effectively, okay, yeah, yeah right. they had proof that he took her out there. I yeah, think witnesses would... saw him with her. Yes, there's enough. He there's was there enough. with her belongings. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah, I had totally forgotten that was like the only charge because I'm over here yeah. thinking he did something to her and they charged him with it. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah there's well, no way. You've got good oh. intuition there because it, it does come into play. Uh, Elvoice Hooper, the deputy DA, asked the judge to dismiss the charge due to being worried about a case of double jeopardy. Ooh, okay. All right. But I'm not I'm not 100% sure it would actually apply. Uh, usually double jeopardy would come into play if you try someone and they're found not guilty. Then mm -hmm. you can't try them again for the exactly. same occurrence. But I guess they were worried that if they tried to charge him on this weaker abduction charge and then her body would be found, that they couldn't try him again for murder. But I don't know that that's true. I think you could try him again for a separate charge. I wonder if they were worried, not worried, but like I wonder if they were hopeful that she would show up and then they wouldn't be able to like charge him like something harsher than just like, I don't know, but I don't know if there's anything that's harsher than that. So yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to follow this and like go no, different routes with it. No, it I, I, it's not making sense to me. This whole thing's confusing to me because I think <clears throat> I think they have that charge in the bag all day, unless they're yeah. worried about um, trying to run that charge and maybe their case wasn't strong enough, and then mm -hmm. he would be seen as innocent on that charge, and then later not being able to try to run a murder charge because okay. they'd be, they'd point back to that case and say, Hey, look, you said this guy kidnapped her and you couldn't prove that before. Okay. I, I think that's, that to me is the most logical thing yeah. so far. Uh, so basically L voice tried offering a plea bargain to try to address his concerns, which it didn't sound like a great deal at all. They were basically willing to give Skip Welch one year in prison for the abduction charge. If he would sign an agreement to waive his rights to claim double jeopardy. <laughs> which his legal team just said, no, <laughs> there's no way. And keep in mind at this point, this guy's already in jail for four or five months. So if yeah. you give him a year sentence, he's already served half of it. Yeah. He's probably not going to serve the full year anyway. Like he effectively would have gotten out within a couple months mm -hmm. and his team still said, nope, nope, don't, don't sign that. Um, and honestly, it's, it was just a terrible plea bargain. Like what you, you've just completely showed your hand to the other side saying, we don't believe in this charge at all, or we don't yeah. think we can get this conviction for some reason. Would you take a year? Man, I was really questioning some of the decisions that were made I here. Oh, I know. And even like, wouldn't it have been better to at least get him convicted and keep him in jail? They were, he was looking at two to four years mm -hmm. on that charge. Wouldn't that have been better than nothing? Absolutely. They did say that if the body wasn't found, that they could refile the abduction charge. But here we are 35 years later, and there's been no charges filed in this case. 
Welch's public defender would not say if their defense was still that Bigfoot had actually committed the crime. Oh my gosh. But would say that Welch had nothing to do with Teresa's disappearance, which is about as believable as Bigfoot kidnapping her, in my opinion. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, five years later, the Fresno Bee would do a follow-up piece with Uncle John Richmond. It says that he's no longer sitting by the phone waiting for the call that his niece has been found. He would state, I loved that child. She was just starting out in life and this had to happen. Uncle John said that he actually spoke with Skip Welch just about a year prior to that article being written and released. Mm -hmm. And he feels like Skip knows more than he's saying, saying, quote, there's been too much deception. Articles would come out about this case with headlines like, Man blames Bigfoot for missing girl. Bigfoot did it, kidnap suspect says. But once again, I think Bigfoot is getting a bad rap here. I'm pretty sure Mm -hmm. there was a monster out there in the woods. Yep. And that monster's name was Skip Welch. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Fresno B. Record Searchlight, Daily Press, History.com, Newspapers.com, Medium.com, and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's story. Uh, Danielle, I really wish that this story would be like yours in that it would have happened more currently. Yeah. Because social media would have been all over this. And absolutely. The many unanswered questions that we had, the pressure of those questions would have been totally different. And maybe this charge would have gone through. I don't know. I'm just sitting here in absolute disbelief that both of our stories ended like that. And I like keep bouncing back and forth on like, does it have like, I feel like with mine, it really had a lot to do with the paranormal aspect and that they strongly believe this, but in yours, it's like very obvious. That's a total load of crap Yeah, and still nothing. And so I like keep trying to find some sort of peace within it all. And there just isn't any, that's so wild to me. Well, um, I might be able to help you a little bit on that. Skip Welch dies at the age of 54 in 1998 due to severe coronary artery disease. Uh, Unfortunately, 10 years after that, Uncle John would die of cancer. Um, And there was some other questions that I had. I kind of touched on the fact that Mm -hmm. was that all the clothing that she took with her? Yeah. Uh, I ran into other information that the investigators actually thought that the scene that they were taken to was staged. So he basically took her clothing, her purse, dumped it at a separate campground that was 100 miles away, maybe, from where he actually took her. Because they did very intensive searches in that area. They didn't find anything to point to her being there. No, and if you really look at it, he very they're like small little flags that show that this was a well thought out plan in his mind. Yeah, You know, he that's how he encouraged her, you know. He had all hey, the time. let's go look at Bigfoot. And she's excited telling people. And he's like, oh, we saw Bigfoot. And this is what happened. He totally thought this out. Man, that just makes me question him, though. Because why oh, yeah. on earth was yeah. that your, like, go-to? I mean. Not a great friend, obviously, either, <clears throat> to uh, Uncle no, John. Like, absolutely uh, yeah, not. I'll give your daughter a ride to school, and you'll never see her again. Exactly. Good grief. And then um, using the whole, you know, something that can't be concrete as a crutch. Yeah. Like I stated before my story. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, despite the fact that Skip Welch has passed away, uh, this is still an open case. So if you happen to have information on this case, mm-hmm. you can contact the Madera County Sheriff's Department at 559 658 2555. Or you could also contact the Fresno Police Department at 559-621-7000. No justice today, Danielle. None. This paranormal experience has taken us all sorts of wrong directions. My expectation was that we were going to find these stories where people use this excuse and it's so outlandish that convictions come through. Exactly. I went into this and was not expecting at all what I ended up finding. Yeah. Yeah. Which is weird because I feel like on my personal like YouTube channel, I have covered a handful of cases like around Halloween where I like look into situations like this and true crime revolving around paranormal activity. And I feel like those are the kinds of things that I have bumped into a lot. But when I did a more direct search, for some reason, it was just things like this over and over and over again. And it's I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I I, I also just want to put it out there. Um, 
maybe I, I feel more akin to Bigfoot because of my acting experience, <laughs> but stop blaming Bigfoot, guys. I know, y'all. He didn't do a thing to anybody. He doesn't want, he just wants to hang out in the woods, take a little selfie every now and then. Leave the guy alone. <laughs> take a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness gracious. And it's time for extra stories. Maybe we can still turn this around with a little justice. Danielle. Oh yeah. Tell me a good one. <clears throat> All right, you guys. So 2006, 18 year old Thomas McGare from Scotland was arrested after causing quite an uproar, swearing at police officers. I mean, just going absolutely wild. And when officers went to arrest him, he just repeatedly kept screaming, it was the ghost, it was the ghost, it was the ghost. And so obviously the police officers are like, shush now, like, <laughs> close your mouth, let us arrest you, let's move on with this, right? No idea what he's talking about. And ultimately, when his case went to court, believe it or not, you guys, he had a defense. And Thomas's defense was that I wasn't the one screaming all those things at police. Do you want to know who it really was? It was the ghost screaming. It was the ghost. It was a disembodied pirate ghost. <laughs> what? <The> di <laughs> no, wait. I love pirates, too. <laughs> We're going to blame pirates now on today's yes, episode as well. Absolutely. It is the disembodied pirate ghost okay. that was actually the one. And, and he wasn't even saying this ghost was speaking through me. So according to his attorney... His attorney, I repeat that, <laughs> according to his attorney, he was all up in arms because he had just seen this disembodied pirate ghost and it disturbed him. And that's why he screamed. But all of the cursing and the charges that he was facing, like all of that towards the police officers, that wasn't him. That was a disembodied pirate ghost yelling at the police officers. Absolutely. Oh, goodness. The no poor, other explanation for it. Poor paranormal. Blackbeard himself. <laughs> all right. All right. We got some justice. Here we go. You ready? Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Pennsylvania, 2014. There was a fire at the home of Joshua Whitman, severely damaging his basement, the first floor, and killing the family cat. Ugh. Thankfully, his mother, who also lives at the resident at the residence, wasn't home. Fire investigators found that a pile of firewood in the basement was doused with transmission fluid and set ablaze. Hmm. When they spoke to Joshua, he said he did it, but he was trying to destroy the portal that the demons were coming from. He also said there were aliens living in the walls. A neighbor saw Joshua riding away from the house on his bicycle as smoke billowed from the home when the fire started, so it wasn't looking good, but... There was another question. Was Joshua dealing with delusions from some undiagnosed mental disorder? His attorney actually filed to have the case transferred to a mental health court, but the petition was denied. Ooh. They also did not bring up mental health as a defense for him when the case eventually went to court. And the judge ruled that Joshua was guilty of felony arson and he was sentenced to five to 20 years in jail. Oh my goodness. And see, I feel like that just brings up another slippery slope of is this person struggling with something mentally or are they literally yes. just spouting off absolute nonsense like, oh, no, I had to close the demon portal. Yeah, this guy had <laughs> like what he had a little more of a criminal <clears throat> history, uh, some drug use that was in there. And I think it was basically because of his criminal history that when they tried to run the mental health angle, they're like, wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> no Look no. at this guy's charges. No, no, no. Um. Yeah. You got another oh one for us? Goodness. I sure do. Now this one comes straight out of Florida and it comes from this year, you guys. And this person <laughs> was not struggling with anything mentally. <laughs> check, check, check. We got, off the bat. <laughs> we got three checks. All right. We're good to go. So on October 23rd of this year, and you know what? Saying that out loud, I think he may have just been being festive. <laughs> mm. I'm liking it more and more. <laughs> On October 23rd of this year, a Florida police officer, you know, just out and about doing their thing, saw this car struggling to make its way down Interstate 75. It's like four in the morning. All right. So upon closer inspection, the officer found out why this car seemed so off. Because two of the three or two of the three tires. Yeah, that's right. Two, two of the four tires weren't just flat. Okay. 
but the driver was actually full on driving on like remnants of the rim. Like the whole rim wasn't even there anymore. Just wow. Driving along. And okay. so the officer pulls this guy over and it's like, um, what's going on here? This is illegal. Like you're an endangerment. What's happening? Did the, the guy like, have his have his tires rotated by Bigfoot? You know what? Maybe. <laughs> Actually, no. You know what really happened? What? Someone put a curse on him. What? He said, quote, somebody put a curse on me. That is paranormal activity. <laughs> Talking about his tires. His tires being like that, that's paranormal activity right there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And he, you know, casually mentioned after that, oh, and by the way, I hit a curb. <laughs> <laughs> but that was part of the curse. The curse of the curb. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, he it turned out he had been, you know, under the influence of a handful of things. He was not paying attention. He probably hit the curb and was like, oh, boy, I just got to get home somehow because I can't call for help. And so he just, you know, sparked himself all the way down the highway. So, oh but very quickly took a turn, started threatening and assaulting the officer, took an even darker turn. He may have been possessed because he was like, I'm going to skin you alive. And so obviously he was arrested. It went from zero to 100 very quickly. He was yeah. arrested and charged with two counts of battery, driving under the influence, a whole slew of charges, and is now facing 25 years in prison. So that's a pretty, Ooh. that's a pretty bad curse. Got him yeah. in a lot of trouble. I just figured out my perfect defense. If I ever get in legal trouble, I'm blaming it on the pirate ghost and the mm -hmm. alien Bigfoot. Absolutely. Working together. Oh, man. That's a duo. That'll get me right off, apparently, according to the stories we're telling today. It was Ohio in 2011. There was no demon portal in this basement, but there was a bunch of stolen items. Former police officer Joseph Hughes was sitting in court facing over 20 charges the prosecutor alleged that he had stolen items, including 12 air conditioners belonging to Morrow County, ATVs from the county impound lot, lawn equipment from Candlewood Lake, where Hughes worked as a security officer. Good job. Uh, a generator. Yeah, know, really? <laughs> yeah, great work there, Hughes. <laughs> uh, he stole a generator, a welder, and get this, Danielle, leg irons stolen from the sheriff's department. <laughs> What do you do with that? That's what I'm wondering. How are you <laughs> intending on using those? I don't know. But he had a reasonable defense. Quote, it's going to sound kind of ridiculous, but we believed that there was some kind of paranormal presence in the basement. There was evidence to support it. Well... The evidence he had didn't seem like it was enough to convince the judge and the jury. He was found guilty of 18 of the charges and sentenced to four years in jail. What did the prosecutors have to say about this? Tom Elkin of the prosecution, the prosecutor's office would say, probably as odd as I've ever heard. I've been practicing since 1983 and I can't, and I can say that's the first time I've heard of paranormal activity in the course of a trial. I like that it was like an attempt at a paranormal excuse, but it wasn't even solid. I, I know like, I'm over here like, okay, paranormal activity. So what are you saying? Like, are you saying some like kind. ghosts teleported it into the basement? Or are you like saying that some sort of like demon it, it was encouraged you to some kind, Danielle, just, just some kind. And there's no, but there's, there's evidence of it. It was the ghost of a Bigfoot. Like, no explanation. Like, you're so solidly saying there's evidence, but you also have given zero information. <laughs> but, Danielle, there is a silver lining to this story, of course. Now, he does have his own pair of leg irons. So oh, good for him. <laughs> everyone comes out a winner. <laughs> Speaking of, who is going to win this month? Oh, my goodness. This is going to be an interesting one because I feel like this is a very different episode. So you guys, you're the ones who get to vote. Who told the best? Blame it on the paranormal story. And you can do that for the first seven days over at Twitter. The account is at Crime After Pod, and you can vote there seven days after this episode drops or... You can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We always have a link in the description box of the YouTube version of this down below. And you can also click the little letter I up in the corner. 
at crimeaftercrimepodcast.com. You can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to join our Patreon, and shop our Teespring store. And a massive, massive thank you to our patrons, you guys. We always have so much fun over there. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. We talk about all sorts of crazy things. Plus, patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. Also, don't forget, you can come and meet us, plus attend our final episode of Crime After Crime at CrimeCon Orlando in September of 2023. Come and meet up with us for the big finale, you guys. It's going to be awesome. And how do you get your name on the guest list and a bunch of free crime after crime swag? Well, I can tell you. Visit CrimeCon.com. Buy yourself a standard CrimeCon pass today using the code CRIMEAFTERCRIME with no spaces. And then email your receipt to CRIMEAFTERCRIME at LordAndArts.com. That's CRIMEAFTERCRIME at L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S dot com. And the sooner the better because we do have a limited number of seats and swag. So you don't want to be the one that has to miss out. That'd be awful. I hate it. Absolutely. Now we'll be back next month with an episode that we might have been looking forward to for over four years at this point. Mm -hmm. This will be Danielle's pick of her favorite topic from everything that we've done before. Guys, brace yourselves. We are doing Most Bizarre Weapon Part 2. I am thrilled. I cannot wait. <laughs> I'm already shaking my head. I don't know where this goes. Most <laughs> Bizarre Weapon Part 2. I mean, uh, hot, hot dog tongs, and wasabi, wasabi pants. <laughs> uh, how can we top it? I don't know. I don't know if we can, but we're going oh. to do everything we can to try. We sure are. Oh, <laughs> this this show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Howland, and John Lorden. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. Thanks again to our sponsor, GlassesUSA.com, for the video version. And remember to click that link right at the top of the description box below to find amazing prices and great service. You will thank me later. Have a great month and we'll see you again soon on Crime After Crime. Bye.